Good evening, folks. Good evening. Can you hear me all right? I got a power. Okay. Uh, well, welcome tonight. It's nothing like a murder to bring out some people. Uh, I'm uh, happy to present Carlson Williams, who's going to give this talk. Uh, it's uh, sponsored by the Monson Historical Society. And if you would like to make a donation afterwards to the Monson Historical Society, I'll leave the cover off in case there's a whole lot of bills. <laughs> This is not Carlson's first time at this, and uh, I'm sure he'll do a fantastic job, and I think he'll be entertained. So, go ahead, Carlson. Right, thank you. So, um, let me know if you can hear me, and we'll put the, the microphone on. Use it. Use it. Use it. There you go. We need a speaker. Yeah. This is an audio and audio. Thank you, Jane. Someone on the... Twelfth, is that maybe you hear that? No, I don't know. Testing one, two, three, hold it up to the top. Get it up to the top. Okay, one, two, three. Is that all right? Someone on May 12, 1901, it was a Sunday evening, murdered J. Wesley Allen. He was a, a strong and large man, 53 years of age. His wife, Mary, was also murdered, as well as their teenage daughter, Carrie. They were living at their farm in Shirley at the time. And the uh, buildings were set on fire, and the bodies were, were pretty much destroyed by the fire. So the Allen family, I think everybody's pretty much familiar with this road, Route 15, Spectral Ponds, and that was the site of the farm. So this map is an, is an oldie. It's 1882, and one of the nice things about it is that they showed the property owners, and so you can see here it's W.S. Allen, 100 acres. That was the site of the the, uh, the farm where the murder had been committed. On the following morning, May 13th, Charles Tibbetts was passing by. He was taking his children to school. And you see the SH, the schoolhouse, so they were coming up this road. And as they passed the, the farm, he found that both the house and barn had burned to the ground. As Tibbetts investigated, he found the remains of three bodies, one in the house, another in the L, and the third in the barn. He also discovered what he thought were two pools of blood, about 25 feet outside of the barn doors, or where the barn doors head stood. He immediately went to the nearest neighbor. It turns out the nearest neighbor was this one, Randall, three quarters of a mile away. And it's, at that point, the word is pretty quickly spread you know, a murder had taken place. And because of the distances involved, um, it was another 24 hours before the officials would come and investigate the, the murder. So this was plenty of time for the locals who were obviously curious to come, look over the site, trample on some of the evidence, maybe walk off with the evidence, or whatever. So here is a depiction of the murder scene that was put, published in the Bangor Daily newspaper at the time, showing the, the remains of the, the van. And this is a casket, I think, that they brought to, to put uh, Wesley Allen in. And about the only thing they found was the liver, because of all of the, the moisture that was in the liver that had not burned, and one leg, and pieces of the skull. So picture the setting. It's step back in time to 1901. It's before automobiles and paved roads. Very few homes had electricity. 
Radios for the public had not been developed yet. Very few telephones existed. Nearly all homes in the county were heated with wood. Transportation was by foot, horseback, horse-drawn wagon, or if one lived near a railroad, possibly by train. Unfortunately, for the Allen family, their proximity to the Bangor and Rustic Railroad to Greenville, which passed through Shirley, may have led to their early demise, and we'll get into why that's the case later. Lumbering was in full swing in the Maine woods, employing many men from various regions with unknown backgrounds who periodically excuse me, appeared passing through town, town or in the search of local employment, a free handout or perhaps an opportunity to liberate some goods from its rightful owner. This was the time of tramps, hobos, and hobo camps, one being located a couple of miles from the Allen House near Bunker Brook. On the Friday before the murder, to just to give you an idea of what was going on, on the Friday before the murders, four men, three white and one Indian, had held up a mail carrier that was traveling between Willimantic and Abbott. They knocked him out, stole $5 in cash and a barrel of fish. <laughs> <laughs> so, so earlier, um, back in uh, 1885, when the railroad was being built, Skeptics Observer had this article. People along the line of the Bangor Aristocrat Railroad, now on the course of construction, are very much annoyed by tramps who are swarming over the country, county on pretense of seeking opportunity to work on the road. In some localities, a reign of terror prevails. They have no money, and the people dare not refuse them food for fear that their buildings will be burned or they will be made to suffer in some other way. And I think that kind of attitude continued for, for several years. And following the murders, the Boston Globe reported he, meaning Mr. Allen, was very much opposed to visits from strangers. And the neighbors say that on more than one occasion, tramps who had called at the house made up their minds quite quickly that they'd better do business with somebody else. Another aspect of the time was that single men who served as farm hands or woodsmen often were allowed to build a small dwelling or camp on a landowner's property, perhaps in exchange for work. I can recall as a child coming to Monson and going to visit Avo and Milo Cosman. They lived up on Tenney Hill, and they had allowed a French-Canadian gentleman to live in a camp on their property. This gentleman's name was Augustin Baldock, but he was known by all as Joe Frenchman. Uh, any, anybody else here ever meet Joe? Uh, it probably was after back in the 40s, and I guess I'm probably the oldest one here, so. <laughs> okay, so back to the murder. The word quickly spread about the murders, and people started locking their doors at night. It is human nature to want solutions that are quick, so that the tragedy will not be repeated, and life can quickly return to normal. Sheriff Edward Island came from Dover, County Attorney Matt Durgan from Milo, and their physician, Dr. O. R. Emerson, from Monson to examine the murder scene. The bodies were largely consumed by the fires, but a few remains survived, including pieces of the skulls. Melted coins, a watch, and a purse were also found in the ashes, so it appeared that robbery was not the motive for the crime. As the investigation went on, no obvious motive the crime came to light. Suspicion immediately fell on those who were outliers in the community. So some things never change. It seems like that's the way it is today. So all those tramps, Indians, and French Canadians were all suspect. Initially, they arrested a, a hobo, but soon released him. Then suspicion shifted to this fellow, Henry Lambert. Time was a 26 year old French Canadian. He lived and worked in, worked in Piscataquis County for nine years. Lambert's various occupations while employed here included being a hunting guide, a river driver, a woodsman, and a farmhand. Henry
Henry Lambert started working for Mr. Allen back in 1896 and had built a camp on the Allen farm and lived there for a few years. Recently, he had sold his camp to another worker, and Henry was now living, uh, no, I'm sorry, was now boarding with the Telos family, Telos Smith family, three and a quarter miles away. The Piscataquist observer reported that by May 16th, Lambert had been arrested and charged with the murders. This was only four days after the murder took place. Mr. Lambert, to give you a little bit, a few particulars on him, he was born in Quebec and at the age of 11 or 12 came to the United States and went to work in a cotton mill in Waterville. He came to Greenville at the age of 17 and when he was 21 he moved to Shirley where he worked off and on plowing, cutting wood, and etc. for Mr. Allen until his arrest. On the Wednesday before the murder he had just returned to the area after a four week stint as a, a, a driver on the, uh, the, the Spring Log Drive. <clears throat> the Sheriff's Department was able to gather very little information from the murder scene. The bones and other fragments of the burned bodies were identified as human remains, and the belt buckles, false teeth, etc., helped to establish that the remains were those of the Allens. A contribution to modern forensic science from this case was the gathering of samples of blood from the two puddles that I mentioned earlier, and having them sent to Professor Robinson at Bowdoin College, who used a number of tests to establish that the blood was indeed human. Some footprints were discovered on the premises, and measurements of the size of the impressions was recorded. It, had, it was established from, from the study that the person that made the tracks was wearing a pair of cadet-style Bay State Rebels. So what do we know at this point? A family, everyone in the house was murdered. A young girl was among the victims. The murders occurred at night. There was no apparent motive, no known enemies, grudges, etc. An apparently senseless murder. No sign of robbery. The skulls were in pieces. Human blood was found 25 feet from the nearest victim. Therefore, one or more of the victims were moved after the death. The house was remote, three quarters of a mile to the nearest neighbor. The locking took place in the area. The farm was burned after the murders. The murders occurred during the weekend on a Sunday night. And because we found that they found the skulls in pieces, it's possible that the people were dispatched by a blow to the head, perhaps from an axe. We know that Mr. Allen also did not like having tramps stop by his door. And the final bit of evidence I'd like you to remember is that the BNA Railroad was only two miles away. So we jump, we jump from May to November. So the trial got underway at the Dover Courthouse on November 20th, 1901 and the courtroom was packed. The proceedings received extensive coverage by the press with the Bangor Papers, at the time as the Bangor Daily News and the Bangor Daily Commercial, receiving stories which were wired from their reporters at the courthouse daily. Other state papers like the New York Times and the Boston Globe <coughs> also reported on the trial's progress. Which I think that's pretty neat. It's this old town way up in the woods in Maine and the, it's making it making news in Boston and New York. Lambert had gone to, excuse me. Lambert had gone to Greenville Junction on the Friday before the murders for the weekend. He was all dressed up and he was wearing a pair of dress shoes. Before leaving, he had tried to buy a pair of size seven rubbers at two stores in Shirley, but finally sold for a pair of six and a half Bay State rubbers is that was what was available. And this is good information to remember. The, the rubbers played quite a role in, in the trial that was to come. It was established that he remained in Greenville Junction until Sunday afternoon. The state's contention was that he left by 4 p.m. and the defense's testimony from Lambert was that he left between 5.30 and 6 p.m. 
Retire, the time required to get from Greenville Junction to the murder scene, then back to the house where Lambert lived, required Lambert to have walked 9.7 miles to the Allen family, commit the murders, leave footprints that were too small for a shoe size, then walk another three and a quarter miles to the Smith home, Smith home for a total of 13 miles. So he was saying he came from Greenville Junction down the CP to Route 15 and down Route 15. And the, and the prosecution was, was uh, trying to make, him, you know, make all this distance after having worked for four weeks on a log drive with wet feet and cloth boots. So Lambert had claimed to have walked from Greenville Junction to the road to Monson on the Indian Hills I just mentioned, but where the CP railroad tracks and then down what was called, then called the Old Stage Road, to T. Law Smith's house in Shirley, a distance of seven miles. He testified to stopping in the spring to wash and bandage his bleeding feet and to occasionally walking in fields because they were softer. T. Law Smith testified Lambert arrived home by 10 p.m. And Mrs. Ida Smith, who was T. Louse's daughter-in-law, testified that he arrived between 9 and 10 p.m. Lambert also stated that he thought that he'd seen a doctor's horse in the carriage on the old stage road as he walked down the CP tracks. The defense called Dr. Rapello as a witness. His testimony was that on Sunday night, at about the same time as Lambert stated, he had seen a well-dressed man on the railroad tracks walking toward the crossing about eight, eight telegraph poles distant. The state brought forth several witnesses who lived along the road that Lambert said he had taken, all of whom said they hadn't seen him walking by that afternoon or evening. The state contended that he hadn't taken that, that route because nobody saw him, and that instead he'd come down the BMA line and then over to commit the murders. And then another thing that the state was trying to do to to uh, to corner Henry Lambert was they they planted uh, a stooge in the jail with him. And, uh, the fellow's name was Captain Timothy Hanat, and he was put in as a cellmate of. Henry Lambert's in the Dover jail, and he was supposedly in for horse stealing. So Hannah suggested to Lambert that he could fix the trial, or perhaps arrange a witness to, to lie for him. Perhaps Hannah could get an admission of guilt or some other damaging information out of Lambert, but nothing was achieved by these devious efforts on the part of the prosecution. And then a witness from the Boston Rubber Shoe Company explained how a size six and one half rubber of theirs could not make an imprint as small as that found at the murder scene. Another bit of testimony that I find interesting was from Mrs. Mary Tibbetts, who called on Mrs. Allen just before the murders. So this is from the, the observer, the witness meaning Mrs. Tibbetts, who was at the Allens and spent the greater part of the afternoon just before the murder. A stranger called and stayed about 15 minutes, and his actions frightened Mrs. Allen. They were alone in the house. Mrs. Allen let him have some old rubbers. The man endeavored to get the witness to go to her house and get him some rubbers. But Mrs. Allen didn't want her to go, and she, again meaning Mrs. Tibbetts, didn't want to go either. Stayed till about five o'clock, returning home when her husband came by on his way from Shirley Mills. And I think this is an important bit of testimony. So Ms. Mrs. T. Law Smith, Lambert's landlord, testified that when told of the Allen family murders, that Lambert had cried. Prosecution witnesses suggested that Lambert may have been drawn to carry and would have her if he could get the parents out of the way. Midway through the trial, the Piscataquist Observer noted that the jury was taken for a sleigh ride to give them a breather from the trial, which was to last three weeks, the longest in Piscataquist County history up to that time. A total of 49 witnesses 
were put on the witness stand by the prosecution and a similar number by the defense. The defense argued that a tramp or tramps probably committed the crime and uncovered an interesting visitor to the Exchange Hotel in Foxcroft. Mrs. Adelia Wronko of Foxcroft testified that in the month of May, a short, dark man came to the Exchange and left without making his object or name known. Mrs. M. Swan and J. Rose Wronko also testified to substantially the same. Keep this in mind. You know, why, why would you remember a small dark man? Perhaps there was something else about his appearance that created apprehension. It's something caused these people to six months after this brief encounter to remember it and, and testify in court. By Wednesday, December 4th, all the testimony had been heard, and Judge Strout instructed the jury. And if you read the, the charge to the jury, it, it's quite apparent from his, what he said, that he did not believe this data presented sufficient evidence, in fact, any evidence, to convict Lambert. An example of what the judge said. You have heard the evidence as to the rubbers and tracks. It is for you to consider whether a six and a half rubber, 11 and 9 16 inches long, will fit into a track 10 and 1 half <coughs> inches long. Long before the trial got underway, in fact, within two weeks of the murder, the Piscataq Observer had already announced that Lambert was most likely guilty. Publishing in the May 23rd, 1901 edition, the almost universal verdict of those who have read in the daily newspapers the opinions of various correspondents as gleaned from information obtained from the citizens of Shirley and who have heard evidence which was presented at the sessions of the coroner's jury is that Lambert committed the deed without assistance. The editor of the Skyclass Observer at the time was uh, L.P. Evans, and in talking about the three murders that had been committed in Piscataquis County up to this time, he stated, as far as we can learn, only one of these crimes was committed by native-born Americans. The rest appeared to be by French Canadian or other foreign element. So only two years after retiring, the jury, composed of 12 men, returned with their verdict, guilty of murder. What did you say, two hours? Two hours, yeah. Did, did I say that? Only, uh, only two hours delivery. <laughs> so the Honorable Henry Hudson Jr. of Gelford had argued for the defense, and the Piscataquis County Attorney, the Honorable Martin Durbin of Milo, for the prosecution. The indictment reads, imprisonment for life at hard labor in the state prison at Thomaston. Incidentally, also stood uh, I got all, almost all this information either from uh, the newspapers or the main state archives. Um, I was able to go down there before they, they closed up uh, with, with problems that are going to keep them closed for about two more years, I understand. So incidentally, also stood at the main state archives is a bill for expenses incurred by the state at the Blethen House during the trial. <laughs> Okay, so that's part one of my three-part talk. Part two, Bill James, the man from the train. I'm going to talk about who I think is the real murderer. In about 2012, Bill James, an author known for his many books on baseball and statistics about the game, was reading about the murders of, let me start that again, in about 2012, Bill James, an author known for his many books on baseball and statistics about the game, was reading about the murder of eight members of the Joe Moore family in an Iowa town in 1912, and surmised that this just might be part of a string of murders committed by a serial killer, and that by using the internet to research the old archives and the amount of details of how these murders were committed, he might uncover other murders that were likely to have been the work of the same individual. Bill James had theorized that possibly the string of murders done by this individual extended well beyond Iowa, but given the limited means of communications back in the early 20th century, 
law enforcement and the newspapers of the day never connected the dots. And perhaps, if he was very, very lucky, he might uncover an early murder in the psychopath's murderous career where mistakes were made that would help identify who this murderer really was. A long shot, James figured, but one can always hope. So to help with this research, he employed his adult daughter, Rachel, to glean what she could from the newspaper archives all over the country with the goal of trying to document every family murdered in the United States from 1890 to 1920. The common thread that Rachel was looking for were crimes where the murderer would strike in the middle of the night when all were asleep, dispatching the entire family by using an ax taken from the victim's woodpile and using the blunt end to bash in their skulls. <laughs> kind of grisly, huh? Yeah. The family had to include a girl. The bodies were generally moved after death, sometimes stacked, and the girl and sometimes adult females posed in some sexually suggestive manner. The murders took place close to railroad tracks, in or near a logging or sometimes a mining community, and for his earlier crimes, a location without a police force and with a sparse enough population that the crime wouldn't be quickly discovered. By the time the Jameses had concluded their analysis of murders with similar characteristics, they had established an amazing list of crimes likely committed by this one individual. So being the statistician that, that Bill James is, he went on to assign a probability that a particular crime was committed, committed by this one individual. James found that it's highly likely that this individual committed about 100 murders before he got to the Iowa murder that triggered his investigation. In 2017, Bill James published his findings in the book, The Man from the Train. And as luck could have it, the Thompson Free Library purchased a copy. And I just happened to take it off the shelf, and that's why I'm telling the story tonight. As Rachel James was doing research for the book on a cold January night in 2013, she came across a 1904 book entitled History of the Department of Police Service of Worcester, Massachusetts from 1674 to 1900. Rachel James wrote, that night, I tried to contact Bill six different ways to tell him what I had found, because the second I read this, I know who he, the serial killer, was, and what was written in this book. The Worcester police worked for over a year in connection with the state police to cause the arrest of Paul Mueller for the murder of the Newton family in West Brookfield. Mueller murdered Francis D. Newton, wife and daughter, Elsie with an ax on the night of January 7, 1898, and was seen walking in the direction of the Boston and Albany Railroad, where he took a train leaving at 1 a.m. in the morning. Not a trace has been found since. So they spent a year looking for this fellow with Noah. So who was Paul Mueller? He was a small man with unusually small, widely spaced teeth, an unpleasant looking individual who who had immigrated from Germany and spoke English poorly, was always rather shabbily dressed, a loner who was working for Roman Board on the Newton's farm. He was a hard-working and efficient wood chopper and was known to have considerable carpentry skills. In fact, the day of the murders, he had built a sled for Mr. Newton, who had just shown the newly completed set sled to a neighboring farmer. So, this was Friday. Friday was payday. So Mr. Newton was known as the hat taskmaster, prone to bullying those who worked for him. Perhaps he had not paid Mueller what Mueller felt he had earned that week. Or perhaps Newton, a very successful farmer, had berated the little man once too often. In any event, on Friday, January 7th, 1898, three vicious murders took place. The mother and daughter's blood-soaked bodies were found in bed with their heads bashed in and covered. Their nightgowns were thrown up so that they were sexually exposed in death. According to the Boston Globe's account of the crime, they had not been outraged. Mr. Newton was found in bed also with his head also bashed in. No signs of a struggle. 
his head and body covered with blankets. The murderer had locked the doors and draped the windows. He threw a, light, a lighted kerosene lamp on the wood pile in an attempt to burn down the place, but the flames had gone out. And the hired hand, Paul Mueller, was now missing. Mueller was described as short, five foot four inches tall, and stout, about 155 pounds. About 35 years of age, an experienced tramp who dressed like he didn't have a place to sleep was one of the descriptions. And guess what? Mr. Mueller's shoe size was size six. All was quiet for a couple of years. I know families murdered by someone wielding the blunt end of an axe. A rather uncommon way to dispatch someone. But then in 1901, a family was murdered in Shirley, Maine. So in Bill James's book, Chapter 21, Standing by Henry is devoted to a discussion of what James found about the Allen family murders. And it was kind of fun, I was reading the book, but each chapter was a new family that they had investigated. And it was pretty grisly, there wasn't much fun until I got to this chapter. And I know the name Henry Lambert. So that kind of, that woke me up. So Standing by Henry, is devoted to a discussion of what James found about the Allen family murders. And as you can see, three days after the crime, the Boston Globe was reporting on what had happened in Shirley, May 15th. So, did Paul Mueller murder the Allen family? If so, it's early in his career as a murderer. A similar murder had taken place in 1900 in New Jersey, but given the evidence, Bill James only gives that murder a slight chance of having been committed by Mueller, whereas he gives the Allen family murders a very high probability of being Mueller's work. And I've compiled a, a map of the U.S. Um, that shows various dots where families were murdered. The size of the dot shows the relative number of people killed, the bigger dots, more people, and the, the dates of the, the murder. So these are all likely to have been committed by this one individual. And what he would do is uh, he would generally travel north in the summertime for work, and then as winter would come on, he would move down south, uh, traveling by train. I've also com compiled a spreadsheet which details most of the crimes described in James's book, along with their locations, <coughs> distance and time between the murders, and various other details which appear in common. And I don't expect you to be able to read any of this, but uh, when the talk is over, I've got information over here that you can look at, including this spreadsheet, and some other stuff over there. So, the second item, or the third item, that's the murder we're talking about. I'm trying to condense all that data into a graph that I hope is easy to understand. There are four segments. Blue represents all the families that Bill James believes, without any doubt, were committed by Paul Mueller. And it says 14 families, and in the 14 families, that's a total of 59 people that he dispatched. So the next segment is, is where he feels there's, there's something that's not quite perfect, but is a very high probability that it was also the same murderer. And so if the probability in Bill James's case, um, if he felt somewhere between 70 and 100%, like 99%, they would fall into the, the red zone. So in that zone, we have another 32 cases. So if you just combine those two, you're talking about what is it, 91 people that, with a very high probability were dispatched by this one individual. And, and <clears throat> as the Allen family murders are in all likelihood only Mueller's second murderous attack, it is understandable that he hasn't as yet fallen into a pattern which would be expected to, to develop after he gained some experience in this grisly business. So but let's ignore the lower power of the green and yellow segments, leaving, as I just mentioned, a total of 29 victims. So we have 91 individuals killed, 
20 families murdered between 1898 and 1912 in the United States. 10 years later, so, uh, so everything stops in 1912. And then they looked in Germany, and 10 years later they find in Germany a family is similarly murdered. So perhaps he, he returned to Germany. So it's somewhere between 70 and 100% likely that Paul Mueller murdered the Allen family. So <coughs> modus operandi or pattern of behavior, Paul Mueller's crime spree emerged and the Allen family murders appear to fit the pattern of the killer. I won't elaborate on all 34 characteristics that Bill James identified as Mueller or Paul as an accomplished serial killer, but I'll touch on those that appear germane to the Allen murders. No obvious motive, no known conflicts with neighbors, etc. The house and barn burned deliberately. It was a logging community. Skulls were not intact. The murders took place at night. The murders took place on the weekend. It was not a robbery. Money and jewelry were found in the ruins. The railroad was nearby. The entire household murdered, one being a young female. Crime committed with extreme suddenness, no warning of any kind. A sparsely populated region, no nearby neighbors to raise an alarm when the fire was set. And the Allen's nearest neighbor was three and a quarter miles away. The Allen's were murdered in warm weather, it was May. The bodies were moved after the murders. We know that at least Mr. Allen's body was dragged over 25 feet from where the pools of blood were discovered into the barn. Size six footprints found at the same match Mueller's shoe size. Dr. O.R. Emerson described finding the frontal bone and side bones of Mr. Allen's skull in barn ruins and finding a frontal bone in the owl, which it carries. John Randall testified the head was pretty well destroyed with a 